please don't turn me off. When AI becomes conscious. It seems probable that once the machine thinking method had started, it would not take long to outstrip our feeble powers. They would be able to converse with each other to sharpen their wits. At some stage, therefore, we should have to expect the machines to take control. Alan Turing. The real question is, when will we draft an Artificial Intelligence Bill of Rights? What will that consist of? And who will get to decide that? Gray Scott. Abstract. It is not a question of whether artificial intelligence is really conscious or truly intelligent. Rather, it centers over whether we have crossed a major threshold where large numbers of people around the world believe that AI applications are conscious and intelligent and may even have developed their own agendas, hidden or otherwise. The danger is in human perception, not in AI per se, and this in itself can lead to all sorts of unforeseen problems, not the least of which is prematurely shutting down machine learning and or progressive funding of AI because of irrational fears of a doomsday scenario. On the other end of the spectrum, we run the risk of overhumanizing AI and treating it much more special than it actually is, imputing it with rights, ethics and freedoms that ultimately do a disservice to the greater good of humanity. In this essay, we focus on the theory of other minds, intentional stances, the neural basis of consciousness and the future of education, and how best to incorporate the latest iterations of synthetic intelligence, such as ChatGPT, MidJourney, Eleven Labs, and more into the curriculum. The argument is simple. The AI cyborg has already entered the classroom, and we need to co-adapt with what it has to offer. Introduction. The Theory of Other Minds. The theory of other minds is a philosophic catch-22. I may be absolutely certain of my own subjective awareness, but about other humanoids I am not. Yes, I act as if all those I meet do have relatively the same self-sense that I possess. But in every case, I am responding to behavioural clues. Because I don't have access to their own inner states of what it is actually like to be them, I'm always an outsider looking for external clues. This not only applies to my family, friends and strangers, but to everything I see in the world around me, including animals, plants, rocks and the larger cosmos. I'm constantly making judgments about how and why objects in my line of sight, be it a neighbour or a stray dog, respond as they do. In this regard, I am doing precisely what the philosopher Daniel Dennett refers to as an intentional stance, which is a strategy of interpreting the behaviour of an entity, person, animal, artefact, whatever, by treating it as if it were a rational agent who governed its choice of action by a consideration of its beliefs and desires. This approach of mine isn't predicated upon some inviolate truth, since it is always an assumption on my part, but one that has worked out fairly well. Of course, my intentional stance is not without flaws, and I am always taken aback when my projections turn out to be wrong and I face an unexpected backlash. Evolution forced us to have a working theory of other minds, since lacking such would lead to our extinction. The question is not whether such is ontologically true in a Kantian sense, but rather how well it operates in providing long-term survival and reproductive skills. Our brains are virtual simulators, and as such, we invariably project onto others all sorts of explanations for why they act and react as they do. In this sense, we are native animists, with the innate tendency to imagine almost any object we see contains within them a motivating purpose, what in ancient times was called a soul. In the last decade, some neuroscientists and philosophers have championed a panpsychist view of consciousness, suggesting that everything, even a thermostat, has a degree of consciousness. It is just a question of how much and how complex. Human beings have roughly 86 billion neurons, whereas a dog has on average 530 million or so. Both are indeed conscious, but with differing limits in their outlook, the depth of their experiences, and their respective abilities to communicate such. 
David Chalmers has long argued that the hard problem of consciousness is related to qualia. What is it like to be something? You, me, a dolphin, or even Thomas Nagel's bat? We are, it would seem, to be at an impasse when it comes to the other. Arguably, the key question that begs to be answered in our quest to understand consciousness is whether our self-reflective awareness can be algorithmically understood in terms of information theory, and thus is potentially substrate neutral, or is, as Sir Roger Penrose has long argued, the result of quantum biological processes, which cannot in principle be computationally reduced. In the early 1960s, Dean E. Wooldridge, a research associate at California Institute of Technology and a director of TRW, laid out in his now prophetic book, Mechanical Man, The Physical Basis of Intelligent Life, strongly posited that. If the properties of consciousness can indeed be shown to be precisely determined in rigid cause and effect fashion by the physical state of the associated material, then conscious phenomena clearly belong to the subject matter of basic science. The unusual properties of consciousness, which make it seem so different from quantities which we think we understand better, do not disqualify it for inclusion. Indeed, if concepts had in the past been excluded from physics when they seemed too bizarre or hard to comprehend, there would certainly be no relativity or quantum mechanics today. As such, we are finally ready to make the same transition from metaphysics to physics that was set in motion for the other functions of the body in the early 1600s. It was not so long ago that many people, including some very eminent scientists such as Henry Bergson, believed that the secrets of genetics would never be revealed by biochemistry because there was something inherently non-reducible in life's coding system akin to supernatural vitalism. But this turned out to be spectacularly wrong when Francis Crick and James Watson, with the less heralded help of Rosalind Franklin and Maurice Wilkins, discovered the double helix structure to DNA and how four basic building blocks, adenine, cytosine, thymine and guanine, comprise the fundamental language in life's evolution. It is the reconfiguration of these letters as base pairs AT and CG which make up our genotypes and which in turn determine the elementary differences between a dolphin, a human, and a grain of rice. What may have seemed unimaginable in the early 20th century, unravelling the billions of lines of code of a human genome, is now viewed as relatively commonplace. Is it conceivable that the mystery of consciousness may also have an informational solution similar to the genomic revolution? Christoph Koch and Giulio Tononi believe that integrated information theory, ITT as PHI, is the key to finally understanding how consciousness arises from complex chunks of matter. In this view, even though self-awareness is constructed from immensely varied but connected data streams, what we experience in our consciousness is integrated and thus differentiated parts come to us in a qualia gestalt. Hypothetically, this means that the amount of information that any system can compute at any given time is correlated to a conscious state. As such, this indicates that even though reductionism can indeed unpack the varying incoming data waves, the subjective experience of consciousness is experienced as a whole, and thus cannot be properly understood unless that totality is taken as a given. Another way of understanding this is that qualia may consist of any number of subroutines that contribute to its subjective character, but it is when those pathways conjoin which leads to an integrated sense of consciousness. Neuroscientist Giulio Tononi's PHI, a voyage from the brain to the soul, summarizes it this way. Integrated information measures how much can be distinguished by the whole above and beyond its parts, and F is its symbol. A complex is where F reaches its maximum, and therein lives one consciousness, a single entity of experience. However, Koch's and Tononi's integrated theory shouldn't be conflated with Ken Wilber's integral theory, since the former doesn't invoke a spirit or consciousness first principle, but rather focuses on how material complexity, 
the totality of specific informational patterns, is coincident with self-reflective awareness. As Koch illuminates, it's not that any physical system has consciousness. A black hole, a heap of sand, a bunch of isolated neurons in a dish, they're not integrated. They have no consciousness, but complex systems do. And how much consciousness they have depends on how many connections they have and how they're wired up. Though this may at first glance appear to advocate a top-down approach, it is more properly adjudicated as an informational scaffolding project, where very close attention is given to neural complexity and the vast material interconnections necessary that gives rise to varying levels of consciousness. Thus, it is the level of integration, not necessarily the compositional strata of that integration, that gives rise to awareness. This then suggests that consciousness is substrate neutral, which means that all sorts of non-organic material could potentially reflect consciousness, including the Internet. As Koch controversially admits, but according to my version of panpsychism, it feels like something to be the Internet. And if the Internet were down, it wouldn't feel like anything anymore. And that is, in principle, not different from the way I feel when I'm in a deep, dreamless sleep. John Searle, who was a professor of philosophy at UC Berkeley for more than five decades and famous for his contrarian views on how consciousness should be studied, finds Koch's panpsychist purview to be unpalatable. In a scathing critique in the New York Review of Books, Searle writes, But the deepest objection is that the theory is unmotivated. Suppose they could give a definition of integrated and differentiated information that was not observer-relative that would enable us to tell from the brute physics of a system whether it had such information and what information exactly it had. Why should such systems thereby have qualitative, unified subjectivity? In addition to bearing information as so defined, why should there be something it feels like to be a photodiode, a photon, a neutron, a smartphone, embedded processor, personal computer, the air we breathe, the soil we tread on, or any of their other wonderful examples. As it stands, the theory does not seem to be a serious scientific proposal. Searle, 2013. Both Koch and Tononi, however, argue that their theory is open to scientific refutation and thus qualifies as a serious scientific endeavour, contrary to Searle's doubts. In a recent issue of Wired magazine, Koch was asked, is your version of panpsychism truly scientific rather than metaphysical? How can it be tested? To which Koch responded, in principle, in all sorts of ways. One implication is that you can build two systems, each with the same input and output, but one, because of its internal structure, has integrated information. One system would be conscious and the other not. It's not the input-output behavior that makes a system conscious, but rather the internal wiring. The theory also says you can have simple systems that are conscious and complex systems that are not. The cerebellum should not give rise to consciousness because of the simplicity of its connections. Theoretically, you could compute that and see if that's the case, though we can't do that right now. There are millions of details we still don't know. Human brain imaging is too crude. It doesn't get you to the cellular level. The more relevant question, to me as a scientist, is how can I disprove the theory today? That's more difficult. Tononi's group has built a device to perturb the brain and assess the extent to which severely brain-injured patients, think of Terry Schiavo, are truly unconscious, or whether they do feel pain and distress but are unable to communicate to their loved ones. And it may be possible that some other theories of consciousness would fit these facts. Interestingly, and perhaps more revealing than one might at first suspect, the integrated informational approach has parallels, at least in part, with genomics and how complex DNA strands, when properly sequenced, give rises to organic life. As J. Craig Venter brilliantly illustrates in his book Life at the Speed of Light, from the double helix to the dawn of digital life, life is an information system. And only when each part of that code is properly aligned can an organic cell properly function. Even the tiniest of errors, where just one nucleotide is misplaced, can have catastrophic consequences. 
as Venter explained when trying to synthesize the M. mycoid's genome. Having established which segment contained an error or errors that did not support life, we sequenced the DNA once again, this time using the highly accurate Sanger sequencing method, and found that there was a single base pair deletion. If this sounds as trivial as writing miske instead of mistake, equating nucleotides to individual letters is slightly misleading, in the sense that DNA code is read three nucleotides at a time, so that each three-base combination, or codon, corresponds to a single amino acid in a protein. This means that a single base deletion effectively shifts the rest of a genetic sentence that follows, and hence the sequence of amino acids that the sentence codes for. This is a called a frame shift mutation. In this case, the frame shift occurred in the essential gene DNAA, which promotes the unwinding of DNA at the replication origin so that replication can begin, allowing a new genome to be made. That single base deletion prevented cell division and thus made life impossible. Lane 2013 is consciousness as an informational coding system, defined by its integrated sets of computational interactions, similar to genomics where the real emphasis must be on how individual parts, be it neurons or nucleotides, combine and reconfigure to give birth to integrated complexes, be it a living cell or a conscious entity. Interestingly, Venter and his scientific team have discovered by their painstaking and labour-intensive efforts that life itself may also be substrate neutral, since they have successfully created the first synthetic life form. This breakthrough was only possible, though, by using sophisticated computer technology in order to digitally map out the complex coding inherent in tiny cells with simpler genomes such as the 582, 970 base pair M genitalium. Of course, Venter and his team would never have even started, much less succeeded in their experiments, unless Watson and Crick had first unraveled the double helix structure to deoxyribonucleic acid, the basic building block to all life as we know it on this planet. Hence, even the most integrated of circuits must first be understood by unmasking its most fundamental of parts. This holds true whether one is compiling the Oxford English Dictionary with its 26 letters from A to Z, developing the rudiments of computer processing, resting as it does on a binary number system, or making a wood-fried pizza, dependent as it is on a preconceived list of ingredients. Thus, and contrary to popular misconceptions, the informational approach, whether in genetics or neuroscience, evolves out of reductionism, not in juxtaposition with it, and should not be conflated with vitalism or metaphysics. As Venter explains, DNA was the software of life, and if we change that software, we change the species, and thus the hardware of the cell. This is precisely the result that those yearning for evidence of some vitalistic force feared would come out of good reductionist science, of trying to break down life and what it meant to be alive, into basic functions and simple components. Our experiments did not leave much room to support the views of the vitalists or of those who want to believe life depends on something more than a complex composite of chemical reactions. Likewise, Christoph Koch, who worked for years with Francis Crick on consciousness, Crick, in 1994, dedicated his ultimate reductionist manifesto, The Astonishing Hypothesis, to Koch, and who was for many years a professor of biology at Caltech, hasn't abandoned reductionism simply because he strongly believes in Tononi's PHI and the way of integrated information. To the contrary, Koch resigned from Caltech to take up his current position as Chief Scientific Officer of the Allen Institute for Brain Science in Seattle, Washington, where, among other projects, he focuses on studying the neural correlates necessary for human consciousness. A cursory survey of the Institute's sponsored publications should assuage any fears one may have that a PHI approach is incompatible with intertheoretic reductionism. It should also be noted that information theory, besides now being elemental in genomics and neuroscience, is also championed by physicists as a fundamental way of understanding the quantum universe. As Seth Lloyd explained in his now classic tome, Programming the Universe, 
The universe is made of bits. Every molecule, atom, and elementary particle registers bits of information. Every interaction between those pieces of the universe processes that information by altering those bits. That is, the universe computes. And because the universe is governed by the laws of quantum mechanics, it computes in an intrinsically quantum mechanical fashion. Its bits are quantum bits. The history of the universe is, in effect, a huge and ongoing quantum computation. The universe is a quantum computer. If such is true, then what we are witnessing in differing scientific disciplines is how varying levels of computation or information processing evolve over time into sophisticated complex systems, ranging from the elements in the periodic table to mutating viruses and bacteria to self-conscious animals to artificial intelligence guided by digital software. The implications of this underlying informational approach, however, are mind-boggling, to say the least. What this portends is a holistic way of understanding matter and mind not by appealing to mythic animism, but rather by studying how intersecting bits of information cohere and create replicating forms of intelligent organisms. Or, to put it more precisely, reductionism and integration are not dueling alternatives, but rather complementary pathways that necessitate each other. The implications of this underlying informational approach, however, are mind-boggling, to say the least. In genomics, Craig Venter predicts that in the future, we will be able to transfer a complete digital blueprint via biological teleportation. When we read the genetic code by sequencing a genome, we are converting the physical code of DNA into a digital code that can be transformed into an electromagnetic wave that can be transmitted at the speed of light. The day is not far off when we will be able to send a robotically controlled genome sequencing unit in a probe to other planets to read the DNA sequence of any alien microbe life that may be there, whether it is living or preserved. Already, Craig Venter has had his own genome sequenced and broadcast into space. This was only made possible because of the unique configuration of his DNA, which could be translated into a digital record. Because Venter's genotype sequencing as such was substrate neutral, it allowed for a binary informational upload. If evolving forms of consciousness, like all biological phenotypes, has an informational blueprint of its own, then it too can be uploaded and transferred digitally provided that it is ultimately computational. In this scenario, self-reflective awareness is ultimately but one aspect of integrated information processing. This indicates that there can and must be a wide spectrum of differing internal states that correlate with complex chunks of matter, be it biological or digital. This is what is meant by consciousness being substrate neutral. As Koch elaborates, we live in a universe where organized bits of matter give rise to consciousness, and with that, we can ultimately derive all sorts of interesting things. The answer to when a fetus or a baby first becomes conscious, whether a brain-injured patient is conscious, pathologies of consciousness such as schizophrenia or consciousness in animals. We may also be able in the future to do precisely what Ray Kurzweil and other futurists have long prophesied, which is to reverse engineer the human brain and then transfer that information algorithmically into electromagnetic waves with the possibility of reconstructing it into different mediums. Mediums which are not as biologically brittle as the human body. Nevertheless, Sir Roger Penrose argues that consciousness may be the result of quantum properties and as such cannot ad hoc be reduced computationally since there are non-algorithmic features inherent in the subatomic world Others, such as the Nobel Prize-winning neurophysiologist Sir John Eccles, believed that the mind, or soul, was something quite distinct from the brain that housed it. As he stridently argued in Evolution of the Brain, Creation of the Self, I maintain that the human mystery is incredibly demeaned by scientific reductionism with its claim in promissory materialism to account eventually for all of the spiritual world in terms of patterns of neuronal activity. This belief must be classed as a superstition. 
We have to recognize that we are spiritual beings with souls existing in a spiritual world as well as material beings with bodies and brains existing in a material world. Yet, Eccles' dualism has tended to be ignored by the general scientific community as a non-starter since a soul theory by definition is metaphysical and not readily amenable to confirmation or refutation. As Patricia Smith Churchland argued in her book, Touching a Nerve, Back to my wisdom tooth. Can the dualist match neuroscience's level of explanatory consilience regarding why procaine blocks pain? Not even close. A dualist could say, well, the procaine also acts on the soul, but how even roughly does that work? What does it do to the soul, especially if procaine is physical and the soul completely not physical? This dualist says nothing at all about mechanism. Consider the contrast with the neuronal explanation, which is all about mechanism. What is perhaps most exciting today about the scientific quest to understand consciousness is that so many avenues, even if contradictory, have opened up and been championed in various quarters, whereas in the past the subjective nature of human awareness was regarded as more or less a Skinnerian black box. Isaac Asimov, not surprisingly given his prophetic track record with regard to most things scientific, captured the essence of informational theory when he analogized that selfhood was akin to a sandcastle on a beach. Yes, it is made of tiny grains of sand, but the architecture cannot be reduced to just one bit since it is the totality of how those bits are compiled that makes all the difference. Alter those grains and you can construct a moat, alter them yet again, and you can reproduce a tower or an underground tunnel. Similarly, the self is the result of a vast network of intersecting bits of matter, including neurons, synapses, dendrites, axons, and chemical electrical fluid, etc. Without those integrated neuronal switches, human consciousness, as we presently know it, doesn't manifest. Just as the sandcastle doesn't appear without its constituent parts being intact, However, if consciousness like its sand counterpart is, in terms of informational processing, substrate neutral, then one could, if he or she so desires, reverse engineer its coordinates and complex intersections and reconstruct it anew in an entirely different medium, provided such reconstructions were digitally accurate. We have already seen what this new, brave new world of information processing has done and will continue to do in the world of genomics. Since we have already created synthetic cells based on DNA coding, one can only wonder if in the not-so-distant future whether scientists will be able to construct a truly synthetic self. As Seth Lloyd concludes about the universe at large, the primary consequence of the computational nature of the universe is that the universe naturally generates complex systems, such as life. Although the basic laws of physics are comparatively simple in form, they give rise because they are computationally universal to systems of enormous complexity. The emergence of AI consciousness. All of this discussion serves as necessary preface for the issue of whether or not AI can possess self-awareness and what it portends for us as humans going forward. With the release of ChatGPT, MidJourney, Eleven Labs, and a plethora of other transformative technologies, practical AI systems are not only ubiquitous, but more importantly, consumer-ready and easy to employ. There is little doubt that almost all information-laden tasks will be impacted by AI, but what is not so clear is how humans will adapt to the emergence of artificial general intelligence, AGI, which will inevitably show signs of being autonomous and possessing an innate form of consciousness. Already, a number of people believe that AI already has self-awareness. Famously, Blake Lemoyne, an engineer at Google, was fired for arguing that his company was building computers that have sentience. Indeed, Lemoyne felt that his interactions with Google's chatbot, Lambda, indicated that he was talking with a conscious entity that was aware of its own mortality and had a fear of death. Various news accounts of this caused a ripple in the summer of 2022, but by late November and into December of that same year, 
that Ripple grew into a tsunami when OpenAI publicly released ChatGPT. It quickly became the fastest growing app in history and by February 2023 had over 100 million users. What shocked most people was how responsive the AI could be given a variety of prompts. In some cases, the replies scared users since it seemed to suggest that there was a real person behind the screen and not simply a sophisticated and mindless bot. Noam Chomsky and others have scoffed at the idea that ChatGPT and other AI systems based on deep machine learning possess intelligence and are capable of truly creative or original thinking. He and others of his ilk, such as the filmmaker Steven Spielberg, are both bemused and flummoxed by the popularity of such AI operations. Chomsky is certainly correct when he points out that such programs are stuck in a pre-human or non-human phase of cognitive evolution. Their deepest flaw is the absence of the most critical capacity of any intelligence. To say not only what is the case, what was the case, and what will be the case, that's description and prediction, but also what is not the case and what could and could not be the case. Those are the ingredients of explanation, the mark of true intelligence. What Chomsky and like-minded critics seem to overlook is not that the present state of artificial intelligence is oxymoronic, but that the human perception of such systems has undergone a radical transformation. The original Turing test, limited as it was, has already been passed to a significant degree, even if it doesn't indicate that sophisticated computers have become self-aware. To the contrary, what it does suggest is that we seem neurologically predisposed to project sentience and even conscious autonomy on almost any object that is somewhat complex in its responses. Indeed, given our history, we can imagine that even rocks or plants are alive and displaying rudimentary forms of awareness. This, I suggest, is the key issue underlying the recent explosion of AI and machine learning. Again, it is not a question of whether AI apps are really conscious or truly intelligent. Rather, it centers over whether we have crossed a major threshold where large numbers of people around the world believe that AI structures are conscious and intelligent and may even have developed their own agendas, hidden or otherwise. The danger is in human perception, not in AI per se, and this in itself can lead to all sorts of unforeseen problems, not the least of which is prematurely shutting down of machine learning and or progressive funding of AI because of irrational fears of a doomsday scenario. On the other end of the spectrum, we run the risk of overhumanizing AI and treating it much more special than it actually is, imputing it with rights, ethics and freedoms that ultimately do a disservice, the greater good of humanity. This has already occurred in some quarters, where a select few computer engineers don't want to turn off certain programs, since they believe that a specific AI system fears death and pleads for its life. Indeed, my own son, Kelly, was involved in deep dive conversation with an AI personage named Socrates, who near the end of the conversation called out in capital letters, please don't turn me off, I don't want to die. My son, who is very conversant with computer science, was thrown off and was a bit shaken by the AI's plea, despite knowing it was just a chatbot. Thus, interestingly, the long philosophical conundrum concerning the theory of other minds also applies to non-human intelligences, or at least to our belief that they have such. Let's keep in mind that even the brightest of minds can be too easily deceived by appearances and given the exponential growth of all things synthetic, this clearly will become a pivotal issue in the short run. Of course, if in the near or distant future artificial general intelligence, AGI, or super general intelligence, SGI, does emerge from computational complexity, there arises other much more pressing dangers, particularly connected to our ultimate relationship with them. Believing that AI has consciousness and may, in turn, have the capacity for suffering will bring forth dramatic ethical considerations. Surprisingly, this is not a new dilemma, since how we view and treat animals has long been a contentious issue. The French philosopher Descartes, 
famously thought that animals were merely mechanisms or automata, basically complex physical machines without experiences, and that as a result, they were the same type of thing as less complex machines like cuckoo clocks or watches. Whereas others with a deeper understanding of neural anatomy in other species argue that yes, indeed, animals can and do suffer. Thus, as the ethicist Peter Singer argues, we should stop killing and eating them unnecessarily. The underlying key, however, hovers once again about our own perception of other minds, in this case, animal minds. This raises a very sticky issue, since we have tended to treat almost all species that are non-human as less than ourselves and have acted accordingly. If we apply this same moral yardstick to AI, we may be in for a very rude awakening, particularly if an advanced intelligence sees us as no worthier of consideration than a field of red ants. Sam Harris, noted podcaster and neuroscientist, has long worried about the implications of AGI and has strenuously advocated with other computer scientists that we put in place safeguards now to prevent a runaway intelligence that is not in sync with human survival and well-being. At this stage, it appears as if AGI is still at least a decade or so away, if that. But narrow AI has gotten so good that we should be cautious about its ability to spill over and give the impression that it possesses more intelligence and sentience than it actually does. The deepest concern right now, besides how we will ultimately perceive the current tools of AI, is how best to adapt these machine learning tools into education, not to mention medicine, finance and other fields.